Frontline Scotland believes this man, William Gage, is in jail for a murder he didn't commit. He's been caught up in one of Scotland's most controversial killings, a gangland execution in a suburban street. According to the Crown, this was an open and shut case. But tonight we can reveal how even the trial judge, Lord Emsley, has raised serious concerns over this extraordinary murder case. We can also reveal that the inconsistencies which helped convict William Gage are now under challenge. A challenge which will rock the Scottish legal system to its very foundations. It's 10 o'clock on a Thursday night. 30-year-old Justin McElroy is on his way home to his pregnant wife. They live in an expensive area of Cambuslang, on the edge of Glasgow's commuter belt. As he arrives home, it's dark, and the street where he lives, Acacia Way, is quiet. But someone is waiting for Justin McElroy. Investigations continue into the murder of a 30-year-old man who was shot last so night outside his home in Canvas Line. The 30-year-old victim, Justin McElroy, was returned... The man was taken to hospital where he died from his injuries. So, a brutal and calculated murder in a peaceful suburban street. A young man left dead, his pregnant wife, now a widow. But almost immediately, this case was shrouded in controversy. That's because the victim... Justin McElroy was no ordinary suburban businessman. The evidence indicates that he was someone who had unsavoury, unpleasant connections. Justin McElroy led a double life. Six days before the murder, Justin had sipped champagne alongside First Minister Jack McConnell at a fundraising dinner. One of the hosts is his father, Thomas McElroy a loyal donor to the Scottish Labour Party and a successful businessman. But beneath the surface, Justin McElroy was in fact a big-time player in the drugs world. For two years, he'd been under surveillance by drugs officers. And four days before his shooting, someone else had him in their sights. A notorious gangland enforcer pays a visit to Justin McElroy. There was a threat which was known to uh, the police authorities, or became known to the, the police in Scotland, um, hanging over his head. Perhaps only Justin McElroy knows the full details of exactly uh, what was going on at that moment. Justin McElroy owed someone £50,000. He's left in no doubt that the debt will not be written off. To find the killer, the police were initially dependent on eyewitness statements. These reconstructions are based on statements given to the police. The first from Justin's wife, Tracy. I was in the kitchen at my home at 29 Acacia Way, Cambus Lang, with my sister Kelly Curry, who stays with me. At this time, I heard three or four loud bangs from outside the front of my house. <coughs> I looked out the windows at the top of the door. I saw a man at the top of my driveway. He was aged late 20s, early 30s, slim to medium build, five foot, 10 inches tall. He was wearing a blue or, or green hooded bomber jacket with a hood up and a similar colored scarf covering his nose and mouth. I leaned out and saw the same person run down the street and out of the view of the house. I cannot identify the man who ran off. Well, generally, the first statement uh, a witness gives is likely to be the most reliable account. Um, one reason for that is that it's at that point the witness has had least exposure to potentially uh, misleading or suggestive information. So, in this case, uh, Tracy McElroy was interviewed um, within an hour of the original event. 
Tracy McElroy's neighbor, Julie Waugh, also gives a statement to police shortly after the shooting. I was lying in bed. At five past ten, I heard the gun go off. I don't know why, I just knew it was a gunshot. As I looked out the window, I saw a man running. By now, he was on the pavement at the front of my house. I would describe this man as male, white, aged 25 to 35 years, 5 foot 10 to 5 foot 11 inches tall and of medium build. The shoulders of the anorak looked padded with square stitching, a quilted look. This is a police artist's impression of the jacket that Julie saw that night. Five days after the murder of her husband, Tracy McElroy gives her second statement to the police. In it, she remembers more details about the gunman. These will prove to be crucial. I have thought hard about the man's description. An athletic male, 5'11", wearing a thick anorak-type jacket, waist length. It had a pearly sheen off it with an Eskimo snood. Gloves, dark coloured, no jewellery. Dark shoes and a scarf covering nose and mouth, wrapped round his face under the snood. The man passed directly under the lamppost outside my driveway and was well lit. We were talking about a witness who saw someone from about 10 or 12 metres away, uh, who was running away at night um, under a sodium street lamp. Uh, and there's certainly limitations to the details of a face that you could see. As the killer escapes, he's apparently spotted by another witness, Stephen Madden. I saw a figure running down the path onto the pavement. His face was covered by a dark or black ski mask. It had two eye holes and a mouth hole. He was wearing a dark bubble anorak type jacket. By bubble, I mean padded. I again looked in my rear view mirror. I saw the front seat passenger in the white car pull off the ski mask. He had a kind of ball face, maybe a bit of a chubby face, a rounded head. His hair was short. He had, a, he had a full head of hair. It was dark black, maybe brown. Stephen Madden's description of the man getting into this car matches those given by both Tracy McElroy and Julie War. But he's the only witness to see the killer without his mask on. One hour after the shooting, the police are convinced they have the getaway car. At 11 o'clock that night, a white Saab 9000 is found abandoned here in Easterhouse, eight miles from Canvas Lang. An unsuccessful attempt has been made to burn the car. Inside is a jacket, a pair of gloves and a snood like a ski mask, a treasure trove of forensics. On the jacket and snood, the police find firearms discharge residue, or FDR, particles which are left after a gun is fired. Also on the jacket, as well as the gloves, the police find DNA. It matches that of a man with previous convictions, a man called William Gage. The police now have a white Saab which was owned at some point by second-hand car dealer William Gage. They have his DNA which was on some of the clothes found inside as well as some firearms particles. All they have to do now is link the car with the murder. Just after 10 I heard a car's wheel spinning. I looked out and I saw a white car. I saw the car was a Volvo, white colour and a white spoiler on the back. The type was a Volvo 440. Charles Bowman was a security guard on a building site next to Acacia Way. The car he sees that night is white, like the car found at Easter House, but he insists it's a Volvo 440 and not a Saab 9000. Despite Charles Bowman's statement, the Crown is adamant the white car he sees leaving Cambus Lang is the same white car abandoned in Easter House. On the 3rd of May 2002, William Gage is charged with the murder of Justin McElroy. On the face of it, the police and the Crown had a watertight case. The DNA, the firearms particles, the white Saab, all point to William Gage being the killer of Justin McElroy. But we believe that if you look harder at the case, as we've done, 
things aren't quite as clear cut as they seem. Firstly, does the mysterious car found in Easter House have anything to do with the murder at all? All the witnesses who see the getaway car insist that it's white. But just one day after Charles Bowman gives his statement in which he's adamant that it's a Volvo 440, something happens to change his mind. I was taken to Paisley Police Office where I was shown a white car that I noticed was a white Saab. On looking at the white Saab, I can say that it's similar to the car I said was a Volvo, although I can't state if it is that car. That's you know, a good example of the suggestion coming from the investigating officers. I think really what you can, can, can conclude from that witness is that um, they saw a white car and they don't really know what make it was. But one detail which all the witnesses do seem to agree on is the type of jacket worn by the gunman. A thick anorak type jacket. The shoulders of the anorak look padded with square stitching, a quilted look. Dark bubble anorak type jacket, by bubble I mean padded. Several witnesses who undoubtedly saw the gunman leaving the scene describe this uh, padded jacket that he was wearing. So I think we can be fairly confident um, in that description. But the jacket found in the Saab with William Gage's DNA on it is a thin cagoule and not a padded jacket as described by all the witnesses. Despite this obvious discrepancy, the cagoule becomes critical to the Crown's case. When the police examine it, six particles of firearms discharge residue are found. The particular residue we're talking about comes from a part of the firearms cartridge which is known as the primer. This is the first part of the cartridge to explode when a gun is fired. This primer, when it is fired, turns into thousands and thousands of minute particles. But only six particles are found on the jacket in the Saab, three on the surface and three in the pocket, and none inside the Saab itself. The particle type is so common as to be untraceable, yet this constitutes the forensic evidence against William Gage. A report compiled by Strathclyde Police states the existence of these particles prove that the wearer of this jacket has recently fired a gun or has handled recently discharged ammunition. But we discovered this isn't true. The report in some respects is biased in that it offered no uh, alternative sources for these particles. They could have been present on the clothing because the clothing had come into contact with some other article of clothing or some other surface on which the particles were present. But no distinction of this sort is made by the report. Given that the jacket had been exposed to six shots or been worn in the presence of six shots, then I would have expected rather more particles to be present on the surface of the jacket. Dr Lloyd is not convinced the jacket's been worn by someone who's just fired a gun. It's not very good evidence, really. Not very good evidence at all. A few months after Justin McElroy's murder, Strathclyde police organise an identity parade. But it's abandoned after William Gage complains none of the parade volunteers resemble him at all. But the day doesn't prove to be a total waste of time for the police. Tracy McElroy is shown a mannequin, dressed in the clothes found in the Saab. I was taken into a room and shown clothing which was on a model. I recognised the clothing as being the same as the description that I had given the police of the man I'd seen running outside my house on the day my husband was murdered. But the clothes are not the same as the ones described in Tracy McElroy's original statements or the police artist's impression. Now the padded jacket has become a thin cagoule. It's quite a bizarre procedure, which I've uh, not encountered um, in any other case that I've uh, consulted on. Um, I'm not really clear what the police were, were trying to achieve. I mean, obviously, it's, it's going to be a disturbing and upsetting event for the witness. 
um, it's probably going to provoke recall of the original event. Um, and then if you were trying to design a procedure to, that would uh, have the potential to plant misleading information or new information um, in the witness's memory, you know, I can't really think of a better way of going about it. It doesn't greatly surprise me that we now start to see some inconsistency of the later statements with the earlier statements. Tracy positively identifying the cagoule means the police now have a witness who can connect the jacket to the killer. And as William Gage's DNA is on this jacket, he's now placed directly in Acacia Way on the night of the murder. That all may mean something, but what it does not constitute is hard connecting evidence which proves that he committed the murder of Mr McElroy. We don't know exactly what he was doing around the time of the murder. But then again, we wouldn't expect that from someone like William Gage, who has uh, come into contact with the police in his past life and who's not unknown to them. Not everyone who conducts that kind of life um, has always got their story straight on any given night of the year. With his alibi discredited, the final nail in William Gage's coffin is hammered home by Tracy McElroy. In court, she's asked if she can recognize the man who killed her husband. She picks out William Gage. It's the eyes. I'll never forget the eyes. Scary eyes. That's certainly a, an issue of, of concern that um, in the court she's uh, talking about the eyes, she's never mentioned them previously. Um, we also know she's seen the mannequin where the eyes were, were prominent. I'm not sure that anyone in Scotland would uh, want to be in the position of being convicted or even having to help police with inquiries where the focus of the evidence was whether or not a person's eyes were so distinctive on a dark night as they fled a location. I'm not sure that that's, in my mind, at least the strongest evidence I've ever heard for identifying someone. Tracy McElroy has never mentioned the killer's eyes in the two years since her husband's murder. Yet now her identification from the dock is the final piece of the jigsaw connecting William Gage to the shooting. Stephen Madden, the witness who'd apparently got the best view of the killer's face, refuses to identify William Gage in court. He sticks by his description of the killer as five foot ten, round faced, with short dark hair. William Gage is six foot two. But Stephen Madden's testimony doesn't matter. Charles Bowman has done enough to hint it was a white Saab, not a Volvo, in Cambus Lang that evening. Three particles of FDR on the cagoule found in the car are enough to hint that a gunman has worn it. And William Gage's DNA ties him to the jacket as well as the getaway car. On the 9th of February 2004, William Gage is found guilty of the murder of Justin McElroy. He's sentenced to 20 years in prison. We believe, having examined all the evidence against him, that William Gage was not the man who killed Justin McElroy. We believe that if his case were to be tried again today, he would not be convicted on the eyewitness testimony used against him. We have significant new evidence which casts serious doubt on the white Saab being the getaway car used by the killer as the Crown claims. In fact, we believe that the car which contained all the forensic evidence used to tie William Gage to the crime was never even in Cambus Lang that evening. And we're not the only ones to have doubts. Lord Emsley was the judge in William Gage's trial. This is his report, which he submitted to the appeal court after the conviction. In a highly unusual move, Lord Emsley is severely critical of the decision to convict William Gage, describing Tracy McElroy's identification of the clothing as uncorroborated and significantly contradicted. If the jacket in particular was not proved to be the one worn by the killer at the locus, then the whole of the Crown's evidence of DNA and FDR would become irrelevant and academic. 
In that event, it would be difficult or impossible to establish any link by corroborated evidence between the appellant and the murder. What links William Gage to the murder is the white Saab. All the ballistic and forensic evidence against him is found inside this car. There's two things we're talking about here. We're talking about a crime that was committed involving a firearm in the Cambus Lang area of Glasgow on the night of the 7th of March. Then the, the, the spotlight shifts. Uh, within an hour, within 60 minutes or uh, 90 minutes, a burned-out car is found in the Easter House area of Glasgow. And what the Crown had to do in the court case um, was to establish a link between those two events. Whether or not those two events were actually connected, in my mind, some doubt resides. If this Saab did not make the short journey from Cambus Lang to Easter House, then the entire Crown case against William Gage collapses. William Gage's lawyers demanded to view CCTV footage covering the roads in between Cambus Lang and Easter House. If the white Saab was used as a getaway vehicle, then surely it would appear on one of these cameras. But delays in obtaining the tapes mean the CCTV footage has never been viewed by anyone connected with William Gage's defense. But the footage has been seen by the police. Tonight, we can reveal the white Saab found in Easter House. William Gage's getaway car, according to the Crown, does not appear in any of the numerous CCTV tapes viewed by the police. And we have the paperwork to prove it. The information it contains was never revealed to the jury at the trial. You may wish to note that there is no CCTV recording of the Saab motor vehicle on any of the tapes viewed by the police. If the white Saab doesn't appear on the CCTV footage, then we can't be sure it is in any way related to the murder of Justin McElroy. And if we can't connect the Saab to the murder, then neither can we connect the jacket with William Gage's DNA on to the murder. Therefore, we can't connect William Gage to the murder. This leaves only Tracy McElroy's identification of William Gage as the one remaining piece of evidence which puts him in Acacia Way that night. She identified William Gage by his eyes. Once again, the trial judge, Lord Emsley, is sceptical. No direct link between the appellant and the murder could be established unless the jury accepted Tracy McElroy's uncorroborated claim to identify the killer by his eyes and at the same time rejected Stephen Madden's description of the killer's face, which did not match the appellant at all. Tracy McElroy's identification of William Gage in court is known as doc identification. It's become hugely controversial. Doc identification is fantastic theatre. It's fantastic if you're a lawyer trying to get a certain result from your jury because it's theatrical. You have got someone being asked, do you recognise anyone in the court today? Or words to that effect. Now, you'd have to be pretty stupid not to know that the person you're meant to identify is the person who is standing between usually two members of the police force opposite you, looking slightly worried. There are humans with doc identification. Other legal systems around the world don't use a, a doc identification as formal identification evidence. I've, I believe Scotland is unique in its reliance on this, this particular method. Since William Gage's conviction, there's been a major challenge to Scotland's treatment of doc identification. It's come from this man, James Holland. Unlike William Gage, James Holland took part in an identification parade. He'd been charged with assault and robbery, yet none of the victims could pick him out. Nevertheless, when the case came to court, one of the witnesses identified him in the dock. Well, she basically comes in, sits down, looks around the court, then the PF asks her, can you see the, the, the accused man or person in court today? And she went, aye, that there. Well, it's like having a big arrow pointing towards someone. It couldn't be more obvious. Everyone, when they're asked to look, will look immediately at the dock. 
the jury's all looking at me, the judge is looking at me, the, everybody's looking at me, and I just, it's like a spotlight went on me. In April, James Holland's conviction was quashed by the Privy Council in London. Scotland's dock identification system was heavily criticised. People were, were pleased to hear about the challenge and particularly pleased, I think, uh, that something that had been taken for granted for so long but seemed so unfair was finally exposed. While the courts continue to rely on dock identifications, I think they will continue to make wrongful convictions. James Holland's case means potentially hundreds of convictions secured largely on dock identification are now open to challenge. This is hugely significant. For cases which ha have resulted in convictions already and where someone is perhaps challenging uh, their conviction, uh, the implications are that they also may uh, have their convictions quashed if the identification evidence is open to the same criticism. The Miscarriages of Justice Organisation Scotland is now examining the case of William Gage. He's currently awaiting the outcome of his appeal, but he fears the worst. Neither the CCTV evidence nor the new thinking on eyewitness identification were heard at his appeal. But both could form part of a submission to the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission. There are many unanswered questions about this case. Who did Justin McElroy owe the £50,000 to? Is this person the key to who pulled the trigger? William Gage remains behind bars here at Schott's prison. He still protests his innocence. Can we say beyond reasonable doubt that the white Saab clumsily abandoned in Easter House was the getaway car? Can we say beyond reasonable doubt that William Gage was the man Tracy McElroy saw running from her house that evening? Can we say beyond reasonable doubt that William Gage murdered Justin McElroy? I don't see any credible eyewitness identification evidence that links William Gage to this murder. What isn't in doubt is that William Gage is no angel with numerous previous convictions. But does that make him a killer? Does that make him this killer? Being almost guilty of murder is not good enough. Being guilty by association is not good enough. Being guilty because you're not straight about your past is not good enough. Being guilty because you can't explain where you were at any given moment of a life which maybe involves lots of not being able to explain moments is not good enough. The hurdle that's to be cleared is beyond a reasonable doubt. And in this case, there are many doubts.